Markham. I'm Sandra Thompson. I lead PwC's Global Technical Function on Financial Instruments. I'm here today with Henry Daubeny. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, I'm here because I co-chair the Bank Working Group and I'm a UK-based London partner. So what is the Bank Working Group of the GPPC? The GPPC was set up in response to a challenge by the FSB after the financial crisis to look at audit quality. And specifically with the implementation of IFRS 9, a number of re relevant bodies have challenged the profession to address high quality implementation of IFRS 9. In response to that, the six firms that make up the GPPC, PwC, EMY, KPMG, Deloitte, BDO and Grant Thornton have issued a paper about high quality implementation of IFRS 9. Before we go into the GPPC paper itself, just going to refresh you with a bit of background on IFRS 9. IFRS 9 is a new financial instrument standard effective from the 1st of January 2018. It will be a very big change in particular for banks and in particular the new impairment provisions. In fact, we think it's likely to be the biggest change that many banks have seen in financial reporting in living memory, and indeed even bigger than when the banks moved to IFRS for Europe in 2005. So who is this paper for and what is its prime contents? This paper is aimed primarily at systemically important banks, but is also relevant to all of those banks that are implementing IFRS 9. It is split into two parts. The first part is focused on governance to ensure that there is appropriate oversight of the implementation of IFRS 9. And the second element is for those who are implementing the standard, addressing certain of the key elements and key challenges that those institutions will be facing. Like other papers issued by ITG, Basel and ETTF, this paper sets out to encourage high quality implementation of the standard. It focuses on the implementation challenges and does not look to amend or interpret the standard itself. Thanks Henry. I'm going to give a bit more flavour about what's in the paper. As Henry said, it has two main sections. So the first is aimed at those charged with governance and it covers three issues. The first is governance and controls. IFRS 9 will require the generation of a lot of new data, systems, modelling, etc. And it's very important that those charged with government have a handle on that and make sure that there are appropriate controls in place. Also, it's important that they understand the models. They're not simply a black box that produces a meaningless number at the end, but they can understand and explain that kind of number. And that's the kind of issue that's discussed in that section. The paper also talks about sophistication and proportionality. When it comes to implementing IFRS 9, there is no one size that fits all. Banks will have some very large, quite complicated portfolios for which sophisticated modelling will be required. But there could be other smaller portfolios, perhaps in, in um, less sophisticated countries, where a simpler approach could be appropriate. And the paper sets out the factors to consider in deciding where on that spectrum between sophisticated and simpler a bank might lie. And then finally, the paper talks about transition and what needs to be done between here and, I, and the application of IFRS 9 in January 2018. Time is actually very short when you look at what needs to be done, ensuring there is appropriate data quality and controls and that things like dry runs, parallel runs are done. And as Henry has said, this first section of the paper also includes 10 questions that those charged with government might want to ask. We're aware it's quite a long paper, there's almost a danger of getting lost in the woods for the trees, and these 10 questions really hone down on what are the key aspects that, for example, an audit committee should be concerned with. If I move on to part two of the paper, as Henry has said, that's actually aimed at those actually implementing IFRS 9. That's likely to be a multifunctional team of, say, risk, finance and IT. The paper walks through the eight key stages in calculating an expected credit loss provision. Things like probability of default, incorporating forward-looking information, the staging, how you move from stage one to stage two to stage three, exposure at default, loss given default, discounting. It goes through all eight of those. And for each of those, it sets out one approach that might be used by a sophisticated bank, one approach that might be more appropriate for a simpler modelling of a, a portfolio, and then finally what you might call some red lines, and some approaches that we think are just not compliant with IFRS 9, obviously subject to materiality. Thank you, Sandra, for uh, explaining the details. Clearly, as a GPPC have put this paper out, we think this is an important step on behalf of the profession in our contribution to enhancing quality application of RFS 9. 
we strongly encourage you to share this document with your audit committees and use it as a prompt for your audit committee chairs to ensure that their banks are applying the standard in an appropriate way. An in brief has been produced on this paper which can be shared with clients and it has links to the document as well.